If, so hello everyone um, and welcome to tonight's event here at uh, LSE. I'm honoured and delighted to welcome our speaker tonight, our, our guest tonight, uh, Professor Richard Thaler. So uh, Professor Thaler is a uh, Charles R. Walgreen Distinguished Service Professor of Behavioural Science and Economics at Chicago Booth. And throughout his career, he's made seminal contributions to a range of topics on economics and human decision making and was awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Economics for his contribution to the development of behavioral economics. Uh, if you haven't already done so, I would highly recommend his recent biographical work, Misbehaving, uh, as well as being a highly engaging account of his own life. Uh, it provides super superb detail on the history of the development of behavioral economics uh, with particularly uh, vivid descriptions of key moments in the debate and the various people involved. Uh, along with his colleague, Professor Cass Sunstein, uh, Thaler has made a number of contributions to connecting behavioral economics policy and law. Uh, the publication of the book Nudge in 2010 was the combination of a set of ideas that had been argued in uh, somewhat less attractively titled papers in the previous decade. Uh, and in particular, the work, um, the concept of libertarian paternalism sets out how institutions can design choice architectures that enable people to make better decisions uh, relative to their own goals. Uh, I think I'm one of three people, uh, including the authors who preferred the title Libertarian Paternalism for the book, but uh, I think it's been a good thing for the public debate that it became titled Nudge, uh, and it's an idea uh, that has, has had remarkable uh, influence around the world and in many debates uh, since its publication. And it's driven a raft of institutional developments, uh, including the development of the Behavioral Insights team here in the UK, uh, of which Professor Thaler was a, a key advisor uh, throughout its development. Um, it's really a fantastic opportunity now to speak with him on the publication of the second ed edition of the book, uh, to discuss the development of the ideas behind the book, uh, new ideas since, uh, and the future of ideas in that area. So Professor Taylor, you're very welcome to London. Uh, I know you have many connections and, and a lot of history of, of working with, with people in, here in London. So in some sense, it's a shame we, we can't welcome you here in person. But on the other hand, it's fantastic to see so many hundreds of people uh, from all around the world uh, being here. So I guess the first thing I would do is uh, is, is welcome you. And uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Liam. I'm I, I'm sad that uh, I'm not there in person, but um, I hope to be back in London soon. Great. And for for the audience, uh, if you'd place questions in the Q and A, so we're going to begin with some questions from myself to 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 Richard, and then uh, we about halfway through we'll switch to. Uh, questions from the audience. So, so I guess Richard, begin with uh, a very, I, I hope, straightforward question: is whether you could briefly recap the the core idea of the original book uh, Nudge and and the sort of debate and context that the the work came from. Sure. So, you know, my my career has been devoted to the idea of uh, introducing humans to economic analysis. It, it, Economists don't really study humans. They study what they literally call agents uh, that don't have any human characteristics. And um, when I moved to the University of Chicago in 1995, I, uh, one of the first people I met was Cass Sunstein, the uh, brilliant and prolific law professor. And we started working on various things. And uh, eventually came, we, we started to think about paternalism. And, you know, the standard economist view in which these agents are perfect decision makers, there's no need for paternalism because people are choosing what's best for themselves. And uh, if, if people are human, and sometimes make mistakes, then maybe they need a little help. And so that's the basic idea. Um, and, you know, uh, maybe our favorite example of the, the kind of help we want to give is uh, the GPS device on your phone. Um, if you think about that, you get to pick the destination no one's telling you where to go. If I want to, you know, if, if we were doing this in person, I would have used it to find my way to the LSE and not get lost. Uh, but that choice would up to me. If I want to stop somewhere on the way and have a coffee, it's not going to yell at me. 
Um, and uh, personally, uh, I have a terrible sense of direction and uh, GPS has uh, been fantastic for me. And that example actually is a good illustration of why we did the possibly stupid thing of completely rewriting a book that was still selling thousands of copies. Um, but when we wrote the original version in 2008, each of us had just bought our first smartphones. And if you think of how much the world has changed just because of that, it gives a sliver of a hint as to why we thought uh, an update might be necessary. And, and just going back to that uh, time period when the book came out, uh, I mean, it's had such a, an influence, I, I guess. Did you anticipate uh, the influence? Is there anything about uh, and how would you really characterize the influence the book has had over the last couple of years? I mean, I guess, including things like the institutional developments, uh, was it anticipated? And, and, and I guess, how would you characterize it yourself, the, the, the influence of the book? You know, we, we were hoping people outside of our immediate family would <laughs> might be a, might be willing to read it. Um, and, you know, uh, the major trade public, uh, publishers had no interest in this book. Um, so it was published by a sleepy university press that, uh, didn't believe in marketing. So it's really kind of a miracle that, uh, that the book ever saw the light of day. So no, it was all. It was all a big surprise to us. And, um, and certainly what happened in the UK, um, you know, the story is uh, Rohan Silva, who was at that time a 20 something uh, precocious advisor to David Cameron, bought a dozen copies of the book and put them in a pile in uh, Conservative Party headquarters as a nudge. And David Cameron picked one up and read it. And uh, that was the beginning of it. It, it. There was something in the manifesto that if elected, they would do something serious with behavioral science. And then much to my surprise, a week or two after the election, I got a call, okay, we're doing this. When can you come over? And uh, that was a big shock. And somebody from the OECD claims there are 400 such units around the world, um, which uh, I, I can, cannot establish whether that's correct, but it, it, it seems to be the right order of magnitude and uh, no one is more surprised than we are. Yeah, I, I mean, it's been it's the the influence has been staggering, uh, really, in terms of the the development of the um, institutions. Um, and I, I think one thing I, I wanted to to ask you was uh, the extent to which um, your um, sorry, what motivated the the second edition? I mean, and also, should we take any hint from the fact that it's called the final edition? Uh, so was there something particularly compelling in the last 10 years that you wanted to respond to or, or something particularly interesting that you really felt, you know, you needed to reissue it now? Uh, well, the, the final edition is meant to be a firm contract between <laughs> ourselves that we will never do this again. It was a lot of work. Cass, you know, Cass could write a book in a weekend. And uh, I'm more of a, of a plotter. And the only reason this happened is that the, the contract with, the, with Penguin, who has the paperback rights, had expired and our sleepy university press publisher hadn't noticed it. And they let us know in April of 2020 and asked whether we might want to write a new chapter or something for a new edition. And there wasn't really anything to do at that time. Uh, we were all in our houses and uh, other than scrambling for toilet paper and wipes and things like that, there wasn't anything to do. 
So we both started looking through the book and there were lots of things that seemed like they could use a refresher and, and many things that just we didn't need anymore. We, we had a chapter on what we thought was a very clever solution to the same-sex marriage problem, uh, which was essentially get the government out of the marriage business. Governments would only give what in the US we call civil unions, so a, a legal partnership, but the word marriage would be a private affair and you're, you could do it at a church or a pub or wherever. Uh, I still quite like that idea, but I must say just making it legal uh, was a, a, an even better idea that we didn't anticipate back in 2008. Barack Obama was at least officially against same-sex marriage. So th things have changed a lot. And then there were a bunch of new ideas that, that we wanted to introduce, um, including sludge, which I'm sure we'll talk about, which is sort of the anti-nudge and smart disclosure. And, and the last thing I will say is that the, the original book was a, a bit too American uh, for given that it's become a global book. Uh, and this time I wanted to go out of our way to make it a, an international book. So, so we got carried away, but I'm happy we did it now that it's done. Great. And I mean, I thought um, one thing that was fascinating was the influence that the original nudge had, as you say, on things like the behavioral insights team, and then the proliferation of this sort of idea that you could have specialist behavioral science capacities within, you know, a whole range of different organizations. And that, in essence, has sort of become a, almost a currency in, in itself. And I just wondered, do you have any thoughts on how um, that will develop in the next decade? Are there things that particularly excite you around the institutionalization of these ideas or, or sort of emerging green shoots of things that you think are particularly promising? Well, I, I th th what I would hope for is that as these ideas become more widespread, they will become more dispersed within organizations, including governments. So I, I think that there's a real drawback to having a specialized unit that's doing this as a, and the, the drawback is that they're given constraints on what they can do. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they're told, look, uh, maybe you can improve the way a certain policy is communicated, but, um, no one's asking, even, even the behavioral insight team in the UK, which is the uh, grandparent of, of them all, um, isn't involved in designing policy from scratch. And both in the public sector and the private sector, that's really what we should be doing. And, um, and maybe that will start to happen as um, the people at the top, be it heads of state or CEOs, um, are at least familiar with the ideas and will incorporate it in the way they think about various policies. Um, and, you know, if we think about the global response to COVID over the last couple of years. Um, in, in many cases, things would have been better if the behavioral science aspects of the policy were incorporated right, uh, right at the center of the COVID policy making uh, unit or units wherever they may be. 
I think that's fascinating, and it, it has something. It's something that uh, I mean. I know you've pushed back uh, in various different ways against this idea, but but I, I wanted to put it to you anyway. It was it was the idea that um, what you would call nudge is a substitute for mandates or for for you know centralized uh, types of policy. I just wonder, in the division you're outlining there, uh, is it, is it more that behavioral science is integrated into a broad range of um, um, aspects of human behavioral change, but is illustrating ways of doing it or ways of making things easier, as opposed to necessarily presuming that it will be, you know, a nudge intervention as opposed to different types of mechanisms of behavioral change. Well, you know, something we say in the new final edition of nudge is that, um, Nudge strategies can help with almost any important problem, but are not the solution to many problems. And I think we have a, we completely rewrote the chapter on climate change um, because we've learned so much in the last, in the last 12 years. And the way we start is to say, we're not going to solve this crisis to the planet just with nudging. And we, Cass and I, and as, as far as I know, every economist in the world think that proper policy has to start with carbon pricing, either a carbon tax or cap and trade um, I, I, I was very disappointed to see th that this didn't come out of Glasgow. Um, and maybe we can talk about that, but, uh, the, the thing we stress is start with getting the prices, right? A lot of good things will happen if you had say a hundred dollars a ton carbon price and uh, in, including all kinds of innovation would happen. And um, so the same with uh, say uh, nudging people to get vaccinated, um, it, at least in the US, and I think this has been true in, in most of the uh, rich part of the world, we, we've gone through three stages. The, when, when the vaccines came out, there was enormous excess demand. Lots of people wanted them. There weren't enough to go around. You didn't have to nudge anybody. Maybe workers in uh, uh, old age homes and things, nursing homes, but other, that wasn't the problem. Then there was this middle period where we had had enough and there were people who were procrastinating or were hesitant or whatever and lots of things in the domain of nudging uh, you know make it easy uh take the vaccine to where the people are give them a pint of beer if they get a vaccine lotteries all of these sorts of things can help but then we reached the stage we're still in now where the unvaccinated have very strong views, in my opinion, massively misinformed. Uh, but uh, in any case, I think um, we've reached the point where uh, we need stronger measures. So at my university, the University of Chicago, we went in person starting in September, but every student and employee had to be vaccinated with some a small number of exceptions for various reasons. And I, I think that's the appropriate policy. So, um, you know, and if you think about the way we run the world, lots of things we don't just nudge, fraud, we prosecute, you know, assault, we throw you in jail. Um, we don't just say, oh, maybe don't beat that person up. 
that, that's not a nice thing to do. No, we're going to arrest you. So um, the, the nudge, nudges are not the final answer uh, to many things, but like I say, they can almost always help. I think um, another concept that I remember when I would talk to students about about nudge and the underlying papers back at that time, you'd get a lot of responses around the concepts like, you know, what if institutions are corrupt that are doing these or what if what if you've got teams of behavior scientists who who are inflicting harm on people in various ways. And I think in the in nudge too. There is, I, if you don't mind me saying so, I think there is a grittier feel to Nudge too, in particular in, in the introduction of the chapters on sludge, where you have, um, you know, the, the, the sense, sense to which choice architecture can go in, in any direction. And I think it's something you'd always said, but, but I think it comes true very well in the, in the edition of the chapters. And uh, I think for, for, the, for those several people in the audience will be familiar with the concept of sludge, but I, I wonder, could I ask you to, to just outline uh, what you mean by that and, 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 and maybe give an example? Because I think it's very useful to start thinking about the, the sort of broader ethical and institutional issues around uh, behavioral design. Sure. So I, sludge may be the first academic term that was uh, coined on Twitter. I think the the proper academic citation should be a tweet uh, th that uh, was induced by a uh, leading London newspaper that um, published the first review of uh, misbehaving, my book that you kindly mentioned in the introduction. And I got an email from my editor saying, oh, the first review is out, here's a link. And I clicked on it and this newspaper has one of the toughest paywalls in the business. And so I couldn't read the review, but I was offered a trial subscription for one pound. Um, and I said, well, okay, I'm willing to pay a pound uh, to read this, but um, you know, maybe I better check um, what I'm going to have to do uh, to get out of this. And, and it turned out I, they would nudge me to stick around uh, by automatically enrolling me in a subscription for 27 pounds a month. Um, and um, to leave, I couldn't just click the way I had joined, I would have to call London during London business hours, uh, not on a toll free line. And so I tweeted about this and said, this is sludge. And um, it soon acquired a hashtag and there we go. So, so, you know, the theme of the nudge mantra, this was literally the mantra at the behavioral insight team, because I would say it in every meeting, if we want people to do something, make it easy. Three words, make it easy. And this is the opposite. If we want subscribers not to leave, make leaving hard. So it's the same structure as nudging, but it's obviously not nudging for good. As, as you know, I've been signing copies of the book, Nudge for Good. Uh, you probably have such a copy somewhere. And um, I, that's always been a plea. So um, there are people who are in, using the same tactics. We, you know, we didn't invent nudging. There was nudging in the Garden of Eden, right? So uh, we didn't invent nudging. We did coin the phrase choice architecture, but that was, again, that was making, that was giving a name to something that lots of people were doing. And the interesting thing is you give a name to something, then you, you you're supposed to become an expert in it. 
And of course, we we weren't in the sense. So if you think of the choice architecture of designing a supermarket, uh, well, we know there are experts in that, that design it in such a way that is a profit maximizing path through the supermarket for the store. Now, they, they, they don't want it to be so annoying you don't come back, but they do want to make sure you walk by the most profitable items. Okay, so we knew that's going on, but we don't, we wouldn't know the first thing of how to do that, right? So um, there's these tools of choice architecture are being used for lots of things. We understand that. And uh, we advocate that uh, both in the public sector and the private sector, people use them uh, for good, but we're not naive. Um, there are lots of political leaders around the world who are doing lots of things well beyond nudging uh, authoritarian governments that are forcing their, their uh, citizens to, to do various things. Nudging is the least of their least of their offenses, but we're, we're not naive to think that, that everybody that's involved in nudging is doing it for society's best interest. Um, we hope that by making these issues more prominent, people will be more wary. So, you know, when I was presented with that child subscription, I instinctively checked to see what was going to happen next. That's what I would, I would like people to do. Uh, if I had my way, you, there would be a law that said, you have to be able to unsubscribe the same way you subscribe. If you can join a, a gym by clicking on a form, you should be able to leave the same way. Um, the, a regulator in the U.S. has talked about mm -hmm. um, making such a rule. I don't know what will come of it. Uh, apparently, California does have such a law. And so here's a tip. If you are a subscriber to any U.S. news outlet and they are giving you trouble leaving, just change your address to California and uh, you'll be out in seconds. So thank me later. You, you've actually uh, answered the, the follow-up question I have, which is, uh, I, I was really interested. Um, I mean, you've been talking a lot about a, a particular US newspaper that has a, a difficult subscription policy, and I'm sure you're delighted that you pointed out uh, on, on a regular uh, basis. But I, I was, uh, you, you sort of answered the question, but I, I think you are comfortable with the idea that as well as choice architecture being designed in ways that nudge people towards better outcomes, that there is a role for uh, groups like the Federal Trade Commission and in general mandates where appropriate for simply to ban practices that have, have no obvious consumer um, or that, that are clearly clearly exploitative. Is that is that a correct characterization of what you're saying? Sure. I mean, there, there are lots of tools in the policy arsenal. Right. And nudges are one, prices are another, uh, mandates and laws are a third. And uh, all we've done is add one to the portfolio of policy instruments that people have. And, um, you know, if if political leaders are misusing this, vote them out of office. And um, I, I have one final question. I'll probably get accused of academic uh, navel gazing now by asking this question, but I couldn't uh, I feel hard not to ask it given that you're here. So, I mean, in the past, as well as your own work being uh, 
pioneering in terms of the development of behavioral economics, you, you've always had a, a strong eye for, for things I think that other people didn't spot were going to be as big. And I'm thinking of your anomalies column uh, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives and, and things like that. So I guess I would ask you, is there work ongoing in, 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 in what you're seeing at the moment that, let's say, the pure blue sky scientific work that you think um, people like us uh, should keep an eye out on or, or that you think could be potentially, uh, potentially influ influential? Well, I, I don't know. I'm I, I'm I'm re reluctant to give advice. I, I, what I will say is that what I long hoped for in the field of economics would be a, a kind of normalization of behavioral economics, in the sense that it, it wasn't. You know, when I was started, it was some radical enterprise. And uh, now lots of economists are writing behaviorally oriented papers, publishing in, in top journals, but they don't, they don't call themselves a behavioral economist. They just are studying a problem that turns out that the tools of behavioral economics happen to be particularly useful. And uh, I'm very happy about that. There are many branches of economics that uh, behavioral approaches would be very useful. Uh, behavioral macroeconomics I, is, th there's some interesting things happening there, but uh, I, I think that macroeconomics should be a field, a, a behavioral field, right? Right now, there's lots of talk about inflationary expectations, but a typical macroeconomist wouldn't quite be specific about whose expectations they're talking about. Are they bond traders or are they uh, people uh, on high street? And if, if you, if you walk down High Street or Michigan Avenue and ask people what their expectations are for inflation in 2022, most people would say, what are you talking about, right? They, they may have an opinion about who's going to win the Champions League or the Super Bowl, but they don't know anything about this. So I think, we, we need to start thinking more about what people have in their heads and um, devising policy accordingly. Great, thank you very much. So I'm now going to try to make my way through some of the questions from the audience. So uh, there's, there's uh, 700 people on the Zoom and uh, I, I'm not sure how many others on, on Facebook. So I'll do my best uh, to get through as many uh, questions as we, we can in the time available. Uh, the most popular question, uh, clearly trying to elicit some uh, in, uh, internal disputes, is uh, do yourself and Cass broadly agree on these ideas, or are there points of contention that you've had to hammer out when you're when you're writing the book? Uh, the biggest bone of contention is that he he uh, questions whether the final edition is a firm contract never to write another version of this book. I've assured him that if there's another edition of this book, it will be after I'm dead. But I don't think we have any other substantive disagreements. He likes footnotes a lot better than I do. Yeah, I have noticed that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and thanks to Kavish uh, Pell for that question. Um, Question from uh, Federica Cocho, um, the extent to which um, nudge-based policies are adopted by authoritarian governments, what's your view on, the, on, on that in terms of um, implication it has for strategies that those governments might be adopting, uh, um, I guess in terms of potential dangers and benefits of, of governments move in, in those, uh, of those types of governments moving towards those policies? Well, I, I think I'm worried about all the steps authoritarian governments are doing. And in some sense, nudge, if they're nudging, 
that's uh, kind of down on my list of things that I worry about. If uh, you can get thrown in jail for uh, saying something uh, negative about the political leaders, um, then uh, over, over my lifetime, I would have spent a lot of time in jail. So, um, you know, if, if they're nudging, that's better than locking people up. So it, uh, I think we should, uh, we should worry a lot about authoritarian governments and have less of them, but that's not the, the, my biggest fear. And a question from uh, Isabella Pasuini. Um, there's a really good chapters in No John Pensions um, uh, Credit Insurance. Uh, what are your thoughts on gambling behavior as a, a potential um, subject in this area? And uh, just expand on it a, a, a little bit. Like, do you think it's an area where there's strong rationale for? intervention or have you have you talked much about particularly the emergence of digital gambling products where you're seeing sort of increasing shares of income being spent on on these quite clunky choice interfaces well um you know certainly uh, that's something that uh we should worry a, a bit about um but I must say in the current financial situation, um, I think a lot of people switched from gambling on sports to gambling on the stock market. And um, so I, I don't think casinos are the biggest uh, risk uh, that, people who are inclined to gamble. Um, now, I don't know whether, uh, I, I was at a dinner party with a group of economists last night and um, I, I'm not sure whether I'm just too old to get um, uh, cyber currencies and NFTs. I admit that that's possible, um, but I don't get them. Um, and, and certainly there are, uh, stock prices that are hard for me to understand. Um, and a lot of people seem to have taken their, uh, gambling to a new place and it's financial markets and well, uh, I would say be careful, but, um, you know, a, a lot of the people who haven't been careful have made a lot of money. So who, you may not want to listen to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely fascinating that you say it. I, I would say um, I, I'm not, I don't know how, if I count as old, but I'm certainly feeling slightly out of touch. So I keep up with these with students and it's increasingly in classes, people will mention NFTs, crypto, things like buy now, pay later, cards in stores as being the sort of new frontier of um, consumer decision-making. And I think it's fascinating your, 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 your thoughts on, I mean, even firstly, how we'd understand those and then, and then, and then regulate them. But um, I'm just looking through some of the other questions here. So um, uh, from Sarah Neubauer, so you say that the use of behavioral concepts like nudge should be used at the design level instead of as an addition to things like marketing or other policies. Uh, in your opinion, are there any public or private enterprises that are doing this sort of design level behavioral practices in a, an exceptionally good way? Uh, sure. You know, I would say think of the companies that have grown the most in the period since we wrote the first version of Nudge and now. And, you know, what companies come to mind? Uh, companies like uh, in the US, Apple, Amazon, um, Google, Netflix. Think about what characterizes those firms. They're all really good at choice architecture, right? I mean, think of Amazon. 
They have every book in the world for sale and you can find it in a few clicks. That this is, and you can do it on your phone, right? So, um, and, and get it delivered in two hours. The, so this is um, taking, make it easy to the limit. And um, now, you know, it's popular to hate Amazon and lots of people who hate Amazon also buy everything from Amazon. So I've, I'm not sure, but um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos took a day and a half class from Danny Kahneman and me. So I wanna take all of the credit and none of the blame for the great choice architecture at that firm. Um, Elon Musk was in that class too, but I think he left after the first day. So that, but um, so I think now I don't know to what extent the they're consciously thinking about. You know, I'm sure they're not thinking about us particularly, but but certainly like Steve Jobs. It, at his core, he he wanted Apple. It make it easy was also his motto. And you know when he introduced the iPhone, you know it, you took it out of the box and you could use it. That was amazing. And so yes, I think. There are lots of companies that are succeeding by being really good at choice architecture. Now, whether, whether you approve of every practice uh, at those firms is another matter. Um, that's, I'm not saying that, that, uh, that I do, but I'm saying they're all very good at this. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of questions and comments along that theme about, uh, and I remember a paper you wrote um, a few years ago in the AOR paper and proceedings looking at the implications of asymmetric information almost being flipped on its head, where we, we will reach a situation where firms that have data on us will know more about our behavior than we know about our behavior. And, and I'm just wondering where your thoughts are on that issue around the amount of data, and, and this is partly to Kang Vu's question, the amount of data that is now available for, for behavioral influence, uh, what would you say are the sort of your core thoughts on how that might be managed? Well, I, I should say, first of all, that um, much of the way those firms use data is very helpful to consumers. So, you know, if, again, if you, if you go to Netflix, they're pretty good at recommending movies and shows that you want to watch. Because if they start recommending shows you hate, you'll switch to something else. Um, Spotify, I think, has succeeded greatly at customizing playlists uh, based on your tastes. So. Yes, they're keeping track of what music you listen to, and then they're introducing you to music you don't know about but will like. That's fantastic. Now, do I want them spying on me? Um, no, um, but uh, I don't mind that they're paying attention to what music I listen to and um, and introduced me to new music that I like. I think that's great. So, you know, there's uh, some colleagues of mine have uh, talked about the, the term algorithm aversion. There's a, a, a very old literature that I know you know about, goes back like 60 years, showing that in almost every situation, a simple statistical model does better than an expert at almost any task. And this was true, 
you know, uh, Paul Meal uh, writing in the 60s and 70s about this. Um, now, what's true is over the 60 years, the models have gotten way better. You know, we have machine learning and so forth now. So the algorithms have got better. People haven't gotten smarter. So, so the advantage that the model has over humans has gotten even bigger. And remember, humans were winning none of these. And, you know, there were a few cases where you could say, yeah, well, a computer still can't beat a human in chess. Ha ha. Right? So there, there's essentially nothing that humans do better than models, especially if they're repeated decisions. Um, but people are uneasy about that. And the decision makers are very reluctant to let um, a model make the decisions for them. And um, I, th I think that's a big challenge because, you know, there's uh, a paper written by some of my colleagues studying uh, bail decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they found was that a, a court was whole, not releasing enough people. They were keeping too many people in jail and keeping the wrong people. So if they had used a model instead of the judge's decisions, fewer people would be in jail and less crimes would be committed by those that are released. So, um, you know, if, if I have some mysterious illness, I want my doctor to be able to you put an uh, AI system on to it and see if they can solve it. I, I don't I don't see why my doctor's own brain should be better than uh, an army of computers. And so I, I, I think a lot of this aversion is misplaced. Interesting. I mean, I feel it's one of those ones that we could easily have spent the, the hour on because uh, and there's lot, there's other questions coming in on, on that vein. I'm going to try to just bring in a few more. Uh, this is a, an interesting one um, in terms of uh, the role of administrative sludge in, in homelessness uh, and poverty and at that end of um, uh, that end of policy. Um, so Vera Hegarty has one about um, we see a huge amount of administrative sludge getting in the way of people trying to get back on their feet after homelessness. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for um, at least ideas of, uh, in the context of administrative sludge in those, in those domains? So I, I'm not going to be specific, but I, I completely agree with the comment. And I think there's a more general problem, which is that if we want to help people, there's a trade-off between how targeted we want the help to be. So for example, in the early, say the first six months of the pandemic, lots of countries, including the US and the UK, were giving people money, some people money. And it, you know, at one extreme, you can just give everybody, just let's send everybody in the country 10,000 pounds. And, um, you know, that, that will in, include uh, billionaires and everybody else. Uh, at the other extreme, we could have people filling out 100 pages of forms to prove that they're deserving. Well, if, if, you, if you force me to choose between the two, I'll take the first one. And I think we, 
you know, if, if we try to fine tune it too much, then we get sludge. And um, we there's, there's a lot of talk about this in the book. Um, in, in the U.S., our I think we have the most sludge ridden tax policy in the world, and um, and it, the sludge. Both parties seem to love sludge. So, and the reason is that the. Uh, that their richest donors, they have different sets of rich donors, but um, they all have their special interests. And as soon as we write a law that helps a certain group of people, um, then the process of figuring out who's eligible for that particular goody, um, whether it's a tax break, break for rich people or a subsidy for housing for poor people, uh, then we get sludge. So um, the, certainly uh, there's a lot to do. And this is something, you know, if we go back to what we we're talking about at the beginning of the conversation, I would love if the government, UK government or whatever, gave the behavioral insight team a mandate to reduce sludge across the board. And now the difficulty is that there's parliament, <laughs> you know, so they're, you're, they're not going to be able to dictate changes, but uh, you, you, there's a lot of good that could be done by streamlining and, and the cost will be that some people who are obviously undeserving will get some benefit and I say, so be it. I mean, again, it's one of those ones, uh, if only we can have multiple sessions, but uh, there's a lot of questions and a lot, I would say in general, a lot of interest around the sort of political economy and the institutional aspects of how choice architectures uh, emerge. And I mean, as you know, there's already a fascinating literature on administrative burden and it's it's explicit use by policymakers sometimes to crowd out um but i think your your ideas and cast's ideas around developing institutional forms formats that would actually reduce sludge or, or including what you say there about explicitly setting something like the bit um would a would a would a heavy political backing into do that type of thing it's a really fascinating uh, uh, idea yeah, let me just give one footnote to that, which is to show the sort of uh, contradictions. People are afraid of, of big data, but le let's suppose that there are no cash payments and that the government essentially knows how much everybody is getting paid in real time. Well, that would make the kind of public policy decisions very easy. So now my policy of sending everybody 10,000 uh, pounds, we can refine that and say, okay, we're gonna send everybody who's lost their job or who makes less than X, we're gonna send them 10,000 pounds and we know who they are, they don't have to apply. So, you think just I would say to the audience, think about which you like less, the government knowing how much money everybody's making uh, or our inability to have efficient policies. You got to have one or the other. Um, and I guess. I'm going to ask one last question because it was the most upvoted question uh, just around uh, from Rami around uh, your ideas around how you would measure some of these effects uh, in public policy. So when, when we're looking at intervening, how, how do you how do you conceptualize the measurement of welfare effects or consumer detriment from different types of uh, choice architectures? Well, I, you know, I don't think it's possible to, uh, to give a general answer to that. 
uh, uh, oh, again, uh, well, uh, the comment I just made, um, to the extent that um, big data can answer a lot of these questions. So for example, the, the fact that everyone is carrying around a cell phone means that in principle, we know where everyone is. So there's, a, there's a, an amusing paper that was written with anonymized cell phone tracking data showing that in the US, Thanksgiving dinners lasted 45 minutes less if family members came from two different uh, political parties. Of course, they don't really know um, how people voted, but they know that somebody came from a, a very conservative place and somebody came from a very liberal place. So you can pretty much guess. So the, the point is that there are lots of things that we could ask what does some policy do to how much time people spend commuting? Well, if we had cell phone tracking data, we could probably answer that quite precisely. And that would be true for lots of things. Hey, Richard, we come uh, towards the end. I'd really like to thank you for that. We covered uh, a huge amount of topics from the, the, the development of the concept uh, ethical issues, choice design, government policy, how all this work would be institutionalized. Um, I guess I, I could just go back to you if there's anything final you'd like to say to, to the audience or any, any, any takeaway. No, just thanks for having me and um, nudge for good, please. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it, was a, it was a real, uh, it was a real honor and, and not one that uh, any of us, I think, would take for granted to 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 be able to hear from you over the course of a, of an hour in such a, a wide ranging way. So, I don't think there's anything else to do unless I'm being told uh, any different, other than to uh, draw the uh, event to a to a close. Um, and uh, yes, to 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 thank you uh, very much again, Professor Taylor. Thanks, Liam.